Okay. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for showing up. I, I'm not Ari Havilar, unfortunately. And this is a talk I gave at Simon's retirement in September, but it was sitting there and it's ready. And I think some of it, something will be new to everyone here. Let's put it that way. Okay. So uh, let's start. So this is Simon giving a talk and that little piece of paper he's holding in his hand is probably a copy of this document from February, 1990. Uh, one of the very first instances of or a publication with structured expert judgment by Simon and myself and Jacques Constein from TNO. And uh, I know you're all deathly curious to know what's in there, but I'm not gonna talk about that. And instead, I wanna relate an anecdote that happened at this time while we were doing this project for the uh, ESA. We were doing probabilistic methodology using probability, obviously, and just down the hall, there was a reliability group who were doing fuzzy reliability theory. And the leaders at STEC said, you know, we, we can't have this, you know, we're gonna have to agree on one approach or the other. So they organized a sort of a tournament in London and we all had to go there and the, each side picked a champion. And our champion was Simon French. And so he got into the lists with the other guy and they duped it out and Simon won. So uh, I'm going to give an example of the sort of argument that we use. This is not, th this was never recorded or written down. So I'm just improvising a little here. Okay, so we get an email from an unknown Quincy. Now the question arises, is Quincy a man or a woman? And you have no idea. So what you would say in the fuzzy language is Quincy is a member of the set of man, the set of men to the degree one half. So you're, Normally you're either in a set or you're not, but in the fuzzy world, you can be partially in. Don't ask for the metric or the topology. But um, so that's, you would say Quincy is a man with fuzzy truth value one half. Well, by parative reasoning, um, Quincy is a member of the set of women with uh, fuzzy truth value one half, right? And uh, yes, they all add the yes, that, uh, that's right. Okay, then the question arises, is Quincy a man and a woman, you see? And if you standard, if you follow the standard fuzzy logic from uh, Sade and so that's been going, you take the minimum of one half and one half, which has helped me a minute now that is, it's one half, right? So <laughs> Quincy is a man and a woman with fuzzy truth value one half. I presented this at a conference for the fuzzies. And he said, no, no, you're doing it all wrong. No, no, that's not right. No, no, no. You, you got to take the product in this case. In this case, you have to take the product. Oh, so it's a fourth. Oh, no, you're doing it wrong. Yeah. And, and then well, what about Quincy is a man or a woman? That's well, also one half. It's the maximum of a half and a half. And you can hear yourself asking yourself, how could this stupid shit, how, how could something so stupid be used at the European Space Agency computing the reliability of rockets that they're going to launch. I mean, didn't anybody think about this? You know, well, I'll let you answer for yourself. So at the end of the day, the people from ESA were sitting at the back and just watching all this. And they said to the fuzzy people, you know, come here, we're going to redirect your contract. <laughs> and it was that simple. It was over. And if you think about, you know, these zombie ideas, they, they just, keep coming out of the grave in, in all these zombie journals. It never, ever stops. But one day at ESA, they said, we're going to direct your contract. I was really impressed. You know, I thought, this, is, this, is the, this is the game we want to be in. <laughs> and so first lesson was foundations really count, right? Don't just say something stupid because it feels good. You have to really think about it and try it out in all sorts of things and make sure that it makes sense. Okay, here's another example in the same vein. It has to do with averaging quantiles, or what I'm calling the harmonic average, HW. And this is very popular because it's so easy to compute. So if you're just doing an expert judgment study and you have a 5 and 50 and 95% quantile from all of your experts, what do you do? Well, what most people do is they just average the five percentiles, average the medians, and average the 95 percentiles, right? 
And that has been done recently in a very big study on COVID-19 models. And that's why we sort of got interested in this again. Published in PNAS, no less than PNAS. This is what they're doing. And a bunch of other guys, including our uh, newly minted Nobel laureate, uh, William Nordhaus does the same thing. I mean, you can, there's just no end to where you will find this stuff. And so if you just think about this a little bit, you can see that there's, this, this isn't going to end well, right? I mean, so here are two expert cumulative distribution functions, right? They happen to be the same shape, just separated a bit. And uh, if I average the quantiles, I'll get this red guy here, right? Obviously. So he's just as convinced that the dis he his distribution is supported on this interval, which is disjunct from the support of this guy and this guy, right? Well, yeah, but what happens if these guys move apart? This, the, the quantile average doesn't change. So it means the quantile average is really independent of the location of these guys. They, you can move them to other sides of the universe and this quantile average will be just as convinced that the, the distribution is supported on this small interval. Well, we can analyze this a little further. If I take that, that, function, that equation back here, this guy, and I just differentiate both sides with respect to R, right? You will find that, uh, you know, you, the derivative of the inverse is one over the derivative. So this is the density of the harmonic weighting applied at this point, which is the rth quantile of the, of the harmonic uh, weighted combination. And that's given by this expression. If you turn it around, you get this. And you see, this is just the harmonic mean of the densities of the experts evaluated at their same quantile points. And so if you know a little about this, you, this is already given, this is a big red flag that should be going up because the harmonic weighting strongly favors the smallest of all of the things it's combining, right? So if you just take the average of 0.01 and 0.99, eh, divide by two, you get 0.5, right? If I take the geometric average, that's the product of 0.01 and 0.99 and the square root, you get 0 0.0995. So that's a lot smaller. But if you take the harmonic average, you get this thing. And that's, I can't read it because you guys are blocking it. What is it? Oh, 0 0.0198, right? That's how strongly the harmonic mean is going to listen to the smallest of the things that it's combining. And you can see that here in this little picture as well. Here we've got two experts. This is Mr. F and Mr. G. And if I take the weighted average of their distributions, I get this green thing. If I take the geometric average, that's also gonna concentrate in a smaller interval, that'll give the blue one. But the most extreme of all is the quantile average and that's going here. And so what you see happening is the density, that's the slope of this line. So the slope of this line is going to be almost equal to the smaller of the slope of this line and this line at the same point, right? And that's what produces these highly concentrated distributions. So do a little more mathematics on this. You can compute that the variance of the equal weight combination is equal to the variance of the means, that's this term, plus the mean of the variances. This is a standard result in probability when you translate it to this problem. But you can also show that the average of the variances is bigger than or equal to the variance of the harmonic average. Now, how does that work? How do you compute the variance of the harmonic average? Well. If I just take the densities, all of the densities that I'm going to be averaging, and I average those densities, however, I impose the joint distribution so that the densities are completely co-monotonic. So that means that if I'm going to sample this distribution and I sample a certain quantile from the first density, suppose I get the 37% 
quantile from that one. Then I also get the 37th percentile of all the others, right? And so that imposes a, a covariance structure, correlation structure. You compute the, the variance, you know, with a formula similar to this thing here. And you get that it's always less than or equal to this thing. And it will only be equal if the correlations, the product moment correlations are all one. And if the two variances are the same. So that's the best case that you can have for the harmonic averaging. And then the question is, how does that work in practice? So uh, let's look at some data. I, I'm going to have to move this screen here so I can see here. So this is from a publication in the International Journal of Forecasting in 2021, where we analyzed 49 studies, all 49 studies from this period involving 530 experts who assessed in total 580 calibration variables from their field. So that's a pretty sizable amount of data. And what we find for these 49 studies that the statistical accuracy for the optimized performance weighted combination with item weights, this is sort of our, our premium model here, uh, the, the best best, theoretically best uh, supported combination algorithm, the statistical accuracy has an average of 0.54 and it has a geometric mean of 0.37, which means they aren't too spread out. If they're very spread out, the geo mean is gonna be a lot lower than the average. And the information score average is at 1.01. .01. For equal weighting, it's a little bit the same story, only the uh, statistical accuracy is a little less but still they're not that spread out. But here for informativeness, you suffer a big loss. So a factor two in information is a pretty big noticeable difference. But for harmonic weighting, you get an average of 0.16, which doesn't smell that bad, but the geo mean is 0.01, which means they're very spread out. And the informativeness is comparable to that of equal weighting. So a more intuitive look at this will say, let's, let's count the number of times, the number of studies for which the statistical accuracy was less than 0.05, which is the standard threshold for a simple hypothesis testing. So for performance weighting, there were three of the 49 studies that were under this. It's actually too little. It would, should have been five, say, but three is pretty good. And for equal weighting, it's two. And for harmonic weighting, it's 28. More than half, in more than half of the cases, the harmonic weighted combination would be rejected as a statistical hypothesis. And if I look at how often is the statistical accuracy less than uh, 10 to the minus three? Well, one time, one time, and 15, right? So it's pretty massively bad, but it gets worse when we look at the point forecasts. So I'm gonna consider the median and look at the absolute percentage error of the median and the standard deviation of this absolute percentage error. And I'm gonna do this for all of these different decision makers. So I'll just run through this quickly. For the item weight performance uh, combination, the absolute percentage error, uh, the average of the absolute percentage error is 2.2. For other performance weighted combinations, it's very similar. For equal weighting, it's 3.8, which is a bit worse, but still at the table, right? And this one means that I take the performance weights and I use them just to combine the medians. I'm not combining the distributions, but I'm just combining the median. So as you know, the median of the combination is not the combination of the median, so whatever you do. So, and here, this absolute percentage error is 278.6. This is, this is a, different, a different number, right? This, this is not variations on a theme. This is just pretty bad. But now when we go to the equal weight, combination of the medians. 
And I want to emphasize that this is what almost everybody is doing who publishes papers in PNAS using expert judgment. They're doing this, right? And the, the uh, absolute percentage error has an average of 1,472.3. I mean, it's just horrible, right? And anybody who looks at the data is going to see this. So the only solution is just not to look at the data. Well, so, um, okay. So the message is data count, right? Look at the data, please. We implore, please. Uh, okay. So here's the last one. This is, I don't, do, you, do you guys see this blocked when I, can you, because I'm seeing this top bar here for the, for the WebEx thing, but okay. We, we don't see it. Okay, good. Uh, continuous rank probability score. Now this is the method that was used in the PNAS article, right? And in fact, it was show me who said, you know, what's going on here? Why don't you have a look at this? <laughs> so we did. <laughs> and and we, we've actually found some interesting things, but I'm just gonna discuss the first wave of results that we got here. So suppose that an expert assesses uncertainty with a cumulative distribution function called F. And Y is the observed quantity. Then we can compute the cumulative ranked probability score as a function of F and Y. And that is this integral. So you take the percentile realized uh, by the value X squared if X is less than Y. So for x less than y, you integrate the square CDF. For x bigger than y, you integrate the squared survival function with one minus one. Okay, that's what it is, and you know it's strictly proper scoring rule, and that's all very nice. And these were introduced by Gnighting and Rafferty in 2007, who say that in that article the applications of the CRPS have been hampered by a lack of readily computable solutions to the integral. Right. Well, that didn't stop them from publishing it in PNAS, applied to all this COVID data. So we decided to compute this for a couple of simple cases. So here are two distributions. This is F and this is G. So F is concentrated on, I gotta move this guy back out. He is concentrated on the interval 0.3 to 0.7. And G is concentrated on the interval 0 to 0.7. And Y is uniformly distributed over this whole interval. So you see F thinks that values outside 0 0.3, 0 0.7 are impossible. G thinks that values above 0.7 are impossible. So G is getting less surprised than F, but they're both quite surprised. So you can compute that the, in this case, the expected continuous rank probability score for G for this guy is this formula. And for F, it's this formula, right? Now it turns out that these two, things are exactly equal if the F guy is constrained, is uniform on H and one minus H. So this is L, right? Is, uh, this, this number should be L and not H minus L, by the way. But so L is equal to one minus H. In that case, these two formulas are identical. So these two distributions have exactly the same expected score, namely 0.19666. And what's happening here with all of these, this type of scoring rule, they are built up as a sum of a score that rewards high resolution and another score that re rewards something like statistical accuracy or calibration. But they will have a certain functional form in each score. And the way those things get traded off is a property of that scoring rule. So since you're doing the sum of these two things, there will be cases where it's like this and like this and, and the score is the same, right? So that's what we sort of look for. What is the contour of this number, right? If I look at all distributions that get this score, what is that? Well, here's two of them, you see. 
and they're very different. And, you know, maybe that's not what you want. Maybe it is what you want. But in any case, it's going to be really hard to explain experts what you're doing here. You guys, you got, you both got a score of uh, 0.19666 and uh, they're rather different. But if you want a more extreme example of the same thing, we'll let F put all of his mass at 0 0, uh, 0.5. So he thinks with probability one, the value is 0.5. And G thinks it's uniformly distributed between zero and 0.5. Whereas in fact, it's uniformly distributed on zero one. These two guys also get the same score. Right? So that's, in other words, the massive overconfidence of Mr. F here is compensated, I mean, or his, I, I, sorry, let me back up. His massive statistical inaccuracy of thinking there's probability one for a value that actually never occurs, right? That gets bought off by his massive overconfidence. So this is just a recipe for disaster. You know, the guy who is most, most atrociously overconfident can easily end up walking away with all of the weight, right? So there you go. Another thing I wanna point out here is that these expectations depend on H, obviously, right? So that means if, if this Y has a certain physical unit, this expected value is going to inherit that unit, right? It's going to be unit dependent. So if this is meters and I switch to millimeters, so one becomes a thousand, five becomes 500, you fill in 500 here and you get a rather different number, right? And so what this means, is if I observe a number of Y's that are not on the same physical dimension, you're just playing Russian roulette, right? I mean, whatever, yeah. Change one of them from meters to, to parsecs and another one from kilograms to kilograms and you just get totally different numbers and it's just totally out of control. Actually, the, there are some things we can do about that, but that's not in this talk. So the third lesson is numbers count. And then we come to the end here, Simon, St. Simon descending from his cross. Uh, foundations, data and numbers all count. So we have to be numerate. And on being numerate was the title of Simon French's inaugural uh, speech. Right, so there we go. Okay, that's all I had to say. So.